patients, we, uh, we're going to resume the hearing. Dr. Koroshetz had to leave uh, due to a previously scheduled engagement, so we excuse him from the panel of witnesses. During the break, uh, we're going to uh, resume with questions. Uh, Mr. Jones, um, I'll go to you, and then when all members have had a chance to ask questions for the first round, I'll ask mine. And then okay. We'll, Mr. We'll Chairman, thank you and uh, for holding the hearing, and Mr. Kennedy, thank you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, regarding mental health, but also the mental health of our soldiers and and their families. Uh, I, I want to very briefly, again, I talked about Camp Lejeune. Uh, a year ago, Dr. Kenyon Mannion, a psychiatrist, was released from his uh, contract at Camp Lejeune. Because of that, I asked for an investigation, and the IG is investigating his situation, but also from that situation, it has kind of expanded. Um, Tom uh, Bogosi was a sergeant, a Marine sergeant that had been overseas twice, and he was in the mental health counseling at Camp Lejeune. It was a uh, PTI, I mean, PTSD, excuse me. Uh, at one point, uh, three months ago, uh, he left the clinic at Camp Lejeune and on McHugh, McHugh Boulevard, he stopped his car and committed suicide at 11.30 in the morning. I want to ask you experts, I'm a little bit from neurosciences to this point, do you believe that the military mental health system could be helped if there was a national committee set up to evaluate military mental health to make recommendations to the Department of Defense and to the Congress. And the reason I bring this up because I've been very impressed with you, your professionals, your experts into an area that I'm not. But as a layman who has a military district in his district, excuse me, base in his district, excuse me, and seeing the pain and the hurt that I've sent, seen over the last few years. Last story, and then I would appreciate your answer about what can we do to strengthen military mental health. Can you imagine having a, being able to speak at an elementary school at Camp Lejeune, Johnson Elementary School, National Reading Day, we're home because of the Easter break. I'm reading Dr. Seuss to 12 kids sitting on the floor. Uh, and as I take questions at the end of it, I say, you can ask me anything. The questions went, have you seen the president? Do you have a wife? Do you have a dog? Those kind of things. The last child, these are six-year-old children. The last child, I said, this is my last question. He looked up at me and he said, my daddy's not dead yet. My daddy's not dead yet. Out of the mouth of a six-year-old child. Now I want to come back to what would be my only question of you. Are we at a point that the Congress needs to say to the President, whomever he is, or maybe one day she, we need to put together a mental health commission of experts like yourself at the table to help our military develop a strong mental health program whether we be at war or we be at peace. Uh, does this have any validity? Because what I'm hearing, um, I know hyperbaric oxygen treatment. We've now finally got it uh, down at Camp Lejeune. Uh, it's not work, it's not, they don't have the staff yet, but we, it seems like we're doing everything we can to deal with the mental health of our military, particularly those at war, but yet it seems like there are just so many different aspects of it that somebody's got to kind of bring it together and have it focus. Does it make sense to have a commission to, to recommend to the military, to the Congress, to the President of what we need to do to make the mental health program in our military stronger and better for the families? Well, sir, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start off. Um, I, I think we need to work hard to leverage our 
existing collaborations right now that we have, and they're very strong and they're very robust with the VA and, and, and NIH. I mean, I, I've tried in my, uh, in my statement to, um, to, to focus on, on some examples, and in my written statement I have, I have more, more examples, but I, I think from my, um, my professional point, my point of view as a, as a, as a psychologist, uh, I think we, the place to start is, is to work hard to leverage the existing relationships and collaborations um, that we have thus far with NIH and the, and the VA on this issue of, um, of family, family studies um, uh, specific to, to, to the military. Uh, Walter, could I interject here? Yes, sir. Do we have standard data points for TBI so that we can collaborate so that a scientist from Rhode Island can talk to a scientist in his district on neuroscience? Because apparently in the second testimony that we heard that we don't from Dr. Koresh's testimony, there is no standard TBI data input. So how can you talk about collaboration? Well, sir, that's a, that, that's a, that's a good point. Now, remember that when we talk about traumatic brain injury, we're talking about a pretty broad spectrum. So that can range from mild in, in concussion to severe and penetrating. And, and everything in between, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of differences um, in there. So it's a, uh, it's a very, very broad, uh, very broad spectrum. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues and if, if they have a, a different view of, of the range of TBI, they can... Well, I think the whole purpose here, as Walter is saying, is that we're all in it together. Civilian research can benefit veteran research. It's not a veteran. Oh, absolutely. It's not, right. So, but if we don't have common data points and there's TBIs every night of the week from car accidents and we can't collect anything that's useful to the veteran in terms of recovery, response, function, how can we be saying we're in it to win it for the vets? I mean, but Tom, you've got the blueprint at the NIH for right. collaboration. So Can there's we, the blueprint has developed of these programs for collaboration, and, and uh, as uh, Walter Korshetz mentioned, there's a real interest in what they're calling common data elements, which uh, the Neurology Institute is putting out for all investigators to use for each of the disorders that they support. So that I think will be an important resource, but. Um, if, if I may, could, can I go back to, to your original question? Because I think the perspective that you're describing is just very different from the personal experience I've had with, uh, as a civilian, sure. uh, representing a government agency dealing with the leadership in the Pentagon. Uh, and, and I have to say this as clearly as I can, that um, the, the level of commitment to um, reducing suicide, to um, ensuring that resilience is supported and to changing culture is greater amongst the leadership in the Pentagon than anything I've ever seen in the civilian sector. Um, these people really believe that this is their highest priority right now. They are very concerned about this issue. I have never seen that level of concern from anyone in the civilian sector where, in fact, the suicide rate continues to take 34,000 lives a year. So I, I, I think, I mean, I understand your uh, wish to be helpful, but I, I do think that it um, underestimates um, what's already happening from uh, uh, an administration that really wants to make a difference here and is um, looking for answers quickly and is trying out things quickly to try to bring this rate down and to try to uh, make life better for uh, soldiers uh, in active duty. Mr. Chairman, can I speak just very quickly and I'll yeah, finish. Go ahead. Uh, I have great respect for the military. I didn't serve, but I have great respect. But this hyperbaric oxygen treatment that has been studied for years and years and years by the military that's why they put a chamber down at Camp Lejeune. They're going to continue to study. Uh, I found out, uh, talked to uh, two people, Bud Day, one was awarded the Medal of Honor in uh, Vietnam for this country. Uh, he was so 
distraught about his grandson who had been severely injured, TBI down in, that he paid for him to go to the hyperbaric oxygen program at LSU. I called him. He said, my son is just remarkably recovered. He can function now. He's not on drugs. So your point, I don't disagree with you, but this still is, now I'm not saying it's the only treatment. You're the scientist, I'm not, but I have talked to three different uh, individuals, including a General Manny down at uh, Florida. You know him, yeah, you're smiling, so you do know who I'm talking about. He was under the treatment at Walter Reed for months and months and months, so no improvement. His wife talked to the doctor at Walter Reed, and she would, went to, I think it was George Washington Med School, and uh, got a, the doctor actually gave a prescription for him to be in the hyperbaric treatment program there. This man's been in my office. He's been elected a, a state judge. He's functioning 110%. But if he had stayed in the military, they would have kept him probably drugged for uh, quite a bit of his life and with no real improvement. So that's my concern. I don't fault anybody in the military. I think they do a magnificent job. But somewhere when you talk about, can't get the word out, like working together, let me say it that way. When you're talking about bringing people together, I just wonder if, if as Patrick was saying, uh, is there a, is there a formula that we can can have for the military to know what is available without having people try to to duplicate other s studies? I just don't know, I, and that's the reason I want to sit here today, and with that, I yield back, but I think... Well, Walter, you hit the nail. There isn't, to answer your question, because there aren't common data points in TBI, which is a signature wound on the war, to help us instruct on whether those are injuries that affect and increase suicide rates. And just as of September 24th, I appreciate Tom standing up for his compatriots who were working hard, but the Walter Reed Army Hospital's Chief of Psychiatry, Colonel John Bradley, said shoddy training and coordination has left us a failure in taking on suicides in the military, from his own words. So I appreciate your standing up for him, but when we don't have the lead expert on mental health and suicides not differentiate between this, or differentiate psychological from neurological, after your testimony saying it's all neurological, you got a big problem here. I, I'm gonna ask the, uh, the gentleman to uh uh, hold uh, some of that for the next round of questions. I've got some questions. Good. And then we can, um, we're going to have one more round, which the gentleman may lead off again. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Insull. I want to talk to you about the nature of stress. Stress produces chemicals which affect the brain. Is that, isn't that right? Correct. And can an abundance of stress in certain individuals uh, bring about organic brain changes? We know that uh, some of the stress hormones uh, alter the way in which cells are born and cells die within the brain. So there's every reason to think that stress does have direct effects on, on the health of the brain. You'll be able to hear a lot more about this from uh, Dr. Akil, who's in the next panel, who's really is, one of the is, world's experts on this. Is there an area of the brain where uh, frequent stress breaks down inhibition towards suicide? Well, the, a lot of the research is focused on the effect of stress on an area called the hippocampus, which is certainly very important for higher cortical function, for memory, for uh, the way in which uh, m memories get encoded in the brain. But the relationship of stress to brain anatomy or brain morphology and suicide remains now a very vague one. There are a lot of gaps in our understanding of, of how these things connect. Uh, well, you know, I, I ask this question because um, if it's not site-specific, than the work of someone like Carl Prebaum, his uh, holonomic theory comes into play. 
I'm sure you're familiar with his, his theories. So there are uh, the places where stress is likely to have the greatest impact is where the receptors for for hormones like cortisol are found in the brain, and they're not everywhere. There are areas that are highly enriched, and those are the places that we look, and in fact, those are the places where we see changes. But again, it's a, it's a, there's a gap here between our understanding of the cellular effects of stress and our understanding of what causes suicide. It's a very complicated area when you try to predict, for instance, who's likely to take their own life. We know some of the factors from a population, but within an individual person, we're not very good yet at being able to have high levels of prediction. I heard you uh, in response to an uh, observation by my friend from North Carolina indicate the work that's being done in the Department of Defense on matters relating to suicide. Uh, you did say that, correct? Right, this is a joint project between NIMH and uh, DOD. Uh, what, what's ironic about that, if I may, is that the stressor in this place, is, in this case, is war. There's a duh factor about this. The latest book about President Obama and the Afghanistan war indicates the tension between the administration and the White House, uh, or rather the administration and the Pentagon, and the um, difficulty that the administration was having in having the Pentagon produce a plan to exit the war. And uh, I think that my friend from North Carolina would, would agree. You can study the nature of suicide all you want, but if you've got increased suicide that's coming from people who are in combat under horrendous conditions where there's all kinds of atrocities being committed, how smart do you have to be to figure this out? That's right. You know, so I appreciate that you're studying it. But... Um, uh, it would be more productive, I think, if a group of uh, scientists would come forward and uh, have the opportunity to do some real tests on how stress breaks down people and uh, how that puts them in that soft circumference of suicidal ideation, which then may lead to people acting and taking their own life. Um, you know, so you, you can't you can't really speak to that because that's not your your uh, area of uh, of decision making. But no matter what kind of how caring the people in the Pentagon are about the troops, as long as you're sending people into this mix master of war, you're going to end up with suicides. I mean, that's you know, there again. I don't think you have to be a neurophysiologist to understand this. I don't think you have to be a cognitive psychologist or cognitive uh, uh, neuroscientist to understand this. War is, you know, we, we put these young people into an impossible situation. They're killing themselves. You know, I don't deserve a PhD for that observation. Um, now, is it true, Dr. Insel, uh, that uh, uh, certain approaches to neuroscience necessarily depend on a mechanistic view of human beings. I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, like Skinner, Skinnerian approach, stimulus response. Behaviorism, you know, if you induce certain stimuli, you get a certain effect. Are we, what, are you a student of that particular type of um, neuroscience? Well, that, that actually falls into a category of what we would call behavioral science. So it really has to do with uh, predicting behavior based on stimulus and response. And one of the things that's perhaps most conspicuous about that is it leaves out the brain. Uh, so neuroscientists tend to think more about the mechanisms by which behavior gets regulated. And they tend to be a little more complicated than just a simple... Complicated, that's a good word. So tell me about it the complications of how we predict behavior. Um, again, I, I'm, I need a little help here in terms of what it is you're well, looking is it, for. You know, there, there's a, 
when you talk about neuroscience, you can take uh, an almost linear view. And I'm, I'm interested as, you know, um, as compared with cognitive neuroscience, which encompasses the possibilities of quantum physics interfacing with neuroscience, where you actually create the potential of, of change that cannot necessarily be explained by this, by the more linear progression of a, of, of a more mechanical approach. Does that not register with you at all? So, so I, I think what... If it does, and I'll withdraw the question. Well, I'm not sure I heard the question, but if the, if the question is, does neuroscience provide a basis for approaching that complexity and trying to understand that complexity, I think the answer is yes. I think we have the tools now, many of which come from very different fields, such as higher math or from, uh, from physics, from uh, dealing with large amounts of information, that we are able to actually begin to make sense of the complexity of how the brain works uh, at, with models that become predictive. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a long way to go, but I would say that we've come a very long way from a simple Skinnerian model of stimulus and response. That's good to hear because every, every, every uh, component of the philosophy of science uh, carries uh, with it part of the headlong momentum of some of the early thinking within those disciplines. So I just wondered where a Skinnerian view fits in. Um, in the testimony that I gave Mr. Chairman, I used the term disruptive innovations. And from my perspective, this last decade has been a series of truly disruptive innovations as we've begun to understand, to go back to Congressman Kennedy's point, that um, the brain really is the gateway to understanding the mind. And I don't believe that we had fully appreciated that uh, in previous decades. I uh, just want to conclude by saying that I, I th it may have been in um, uh, I don't think it was in your testimony, but maybe in your colleague who just had to leave, um, spoke of the light shining on um, uh, microbial membranes that opened up new channels. Is that what you're talking about? Well, that's a, that's a technique which has been used technique, to be able to, to uh, study circuitry in the brain in a very precise way. But, uh, I mean, the... I think you understand the comparison I'm making, and that is that uh, if you use light as a metaphor here, shining itself on, um, on, on certain membranes, opening up new, new channels, uh, it's, it's a metaphor for the possibilities of neuroscience to go into areas which would make the work that you're, seeming, uh, that you're working out right now uh, seem um, um, primitive in years to come, with all due respect. I think you, I think I really, I'm a fan of what, uh, of neuroscience's capabilities, and so I appreciate your, um, your presence here. Thank you, if I may, just as a final comment about this, uh, I think it needs to be said we're in the middle of a revolution, yeah. and in uh, 20 to 30 years we'll look back on this period to realize how little we knew but the tools are there to transform the way we think about the brain, and as Someone said in the opening comments, this is really the last great frontier of science. And for the first time, I think we have the discovery tools that we've needed to really explore and to colonize that frontier in a different way. I, just one other question occurs to me. I don't know if you're able to uh, answer this, but... Um, the phenomenon of fear, the emotion of fear, it's, uh, it, I've seen some uh, studies that suggest that uh, it, origi it originates in a limbic system, is that right? It's, we, we use the term mediated by, mediated uh, by, the, by, the, by yes. the limbic system, and is, and, and is that uh, really on an evolutionary standpoint uh, part of what some might call part of the reptilian brain? the flight or, f uh, or fight syndrome? Yeah, those, so those are models that we have 
kind of uh, given up a few years ago, but the idea of having well, I'm a talking about the kind of the, the sort of core archaeology of your right a, discipline. A, a core ancient part of the brain um, which feeds into those kinds of fight or flight impulses. Since you work with the uh, and since people in the neuroscience discipline work with the Department of, of Defense, uh, is anyone doing any studies? about uh, the potential of uh, transformation uh, beyond fear, which often puts people into this fight or flight, which is a precursor for uh, inevitably, on a macrocosmic level, the precursor of war. I mean, does anybody ever think about that? I'm not sure that we're where you are on these uh, on this idea. So there's a, a tremendous amount of research right now on the fundamental neurobiology of fear and fear responses, and, and particularly what we call extinction, the ability to overcome fear. But it, the relationship of that to um, to war is uh, a place where I think most neuroscientists haven't gone. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Second round. Thank you. Um, I think the most uh, significant issue is how to do the research so we make the most of what we know. It's not how much we know, it's how much uh, we, you know, don't know that we know. And that gets back to the common data points for TBI. So we can't do the data mining and find out what's working or what isn't if there isn't common language and nomenclature. You have a blueprint at NIH. Does that blueprint include DOD and VA? And if not, why not? And uh, to Dr. Coopersmith, do you have, uh, along with the DOD and Terry, the uh, ability to have a common program, computer program, to input, you know, these data points or, or not? First, Tom. Um, that, oh, so uh, just very quickly, we do have a blueprint, which is a um, consortium of, uh, I think, 15 institutes and centers at NIH for some common projects. It's a, a fairly limited effort. It, it's identifying areas of common need and pushing ahead uh, on a few of those. It does not involve DOD, VA, or many of the other institutes at NIH even. So it's, uh, it is truly a kind of homegrown project. But it hasn't in any way inhibited m many of the institutes, my own included, NIMH, from these very large collaborations, as I said, the, the biggest project we're doing is the collaboration with DOD, and it's, it's really um, become our signature project for 2010, and probably will be for the next few years. So it doesn't, the blueprint's not part of that, but um, it almost doesn't need to be. We've got a lot going on um, just out of the Institute itself. But we, don't, we don't have a program that allows for all this data to be put in so we're all scientists in one area of the country can f find out what the scientists in the other area of the country is doing so we can work to a greater effect to everybody's advantage. We don't have that. Uh, we don't have a single uh, data repository um, at this point for, uh, other than for autism, I don't think that exists for any area that our institute's working in. Would it be useful to everybody? I know you have these collaborations and it's helpful, but could we dedicate funding that would leverage what the institutes do by giving a little money to help bring them and their work together to help and maximize each other in a coordinated way? So we have done that in autism, and I think it's been transformative. Uh, we have a, an opportunity now for virtually every project to flow into the same um, database called the National Database for Autism Research, and uh, that's a model that could be followed in a number of areas. That's terrific. Dr. Cooper Smith? We, our commuters uh, at, uh, have not merged yet with DOD, but there's a tremendous amount of work on that, and that is a goal, certainly, of this administration. But, um, you know, our computer system evolved out of a clinical computer system, sort of from the ground up, with uh, um, uh, <coughs> investigators creating software merging into a large system. So that, that is clearly a goal of this administration. It's not a research um, uh, topic per se, although research will benefit greatly from it. That's right. And uh, um, we, we are looking forward to be able to do that. 
Because if we don't know what we know, we're right. just doomed to repeat the science. Absolutely. And I think that quotes Albert Einstein, actually. Well, you know, I'd like to <laughs> often get confused for him and my yeah. uh, intellectual interpretation <laughs> for things. But, but um, it, I, I, there is uh, very hard work, uh, as, uh, as many know, is, is going on, on, on that. Very important. Well, thank you. And, and Terry, what would you say, Dr. Rausch, about uh, the need to get DOD to help open up what Tom has in his NIH and what the VA and make it all so everybody's helping to a common effort, both soldiers benefiting, but then civilian and civilians benefiting from soldier and vice versa. Yeah, I, you, you, make a, you make a very good point, sir. We, we are working on it. We have a, we have a collaborative uh, effort with VA, um, NIH, DOD, Department of Education. Uh, it's called the Common Data Elements Project. And um, its purpose is to do exactly what you charged us to do, and that is to standardize terminology within TBI and the psych health portfolio. Um, it's um, it's uh, in development, it's in progress, but it's it has started. And um, you know, I, I think I probably need to take this for the record and give you some more information because that. Your question really deserves um, a more detailed answer, and I'd like to provide more detail on the uh, Common Data Elements Project for TBI and Psych Health. Super, super. Well, thank you, and that's, uh, that's what the hearing's about. What can we do in Congress to help leverage what you're already doing and what the science shows us out there already? Uh, Congressman, Congressman Kennedy, there's a... Um, um, a person by the name of uh, George Faure, who um, uh, was a physicist and is a philosopher, and he spoke to uh, science as a structure-specific language uh, constructed for the representation of what there is. And so semantics do count because they link through uh, their expression to uh, specific structures that help either to confirm pre-existing notions of a science or disconfirm them. So um, the point that you raised about the, uh, the nomenclature is not a small matter. It's, it's actually uh, quite significant, not just for uh, uh, the subject of a, of a particular type of behavior, but the, there are implications, broader social implications. Now, um, are, you, are you done? I just repeat, Tom, what you said. You go fast, go alone, but go far, you go together. But we need to go far together, but we need to go faster. And uh, if you can provide us some recommendations from your point of view as to what FDA can do, since they're integral and whatever comes up from your researchers, to get, if we get a finding right into the field for our soldier and our veteran, that would be very useful if you could give us some ideas on regulatory science. Again, this is process issues, as you just said, Dr. Coopersmith. It doesn't involve the science, but the science can't be maximized unless you get the process right. So if you could provide us some input on that, as you have already kind of in your testimony, it helps us make a better case politically. Right? If we just put some dollars here, we leverage a whole bunch. If we work as a team, we get further. And your blueprint's are perfect. How do we institutionalize that more, get the common data sets and uh, standardized terminology together? And so Thanks. that would be useful. Uh, thank you, Congressman Kennedy. I, I just uh, have a couple of brief questions. We'll go to our next panel. Um, one of you gentlemen brought up uh, uh, nutrition. Was it you, Mr. Rausch? Uh, in what context did you bring that up? Uh, I brought that into con up in the context of um, uh, nutritional interventions in the whole psych health, TBI, PTSD portfolio to include uh, looking at uh, nutraceuticals. Um, and that's an um, area in which we have a number of projects that we're, that we're funding. Um. John Robbins, uh, the author, has, uh, 
has written extensively about the impact uh,